Welcome to this bioscience oh. webinar. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome all of you to this um, very exciting webinars that we do have ahead of us. The theme and the name of the bio or this webinar is um, Time to Face It. Um, I have a stellar co-faculty with me. Um, we're having Dr. Andrea Margara. We're having Dr. Nazar Ruiz Lopez with me. Um, and um, we're discussing basically every step from the anatomy of the face, how you can use the range of fillers that bioscience offers to you, either from the genital or from the higher corp portfolio. And um, we will kind of cover all those different components that you need to perform minimally invasive procedures. We're really excited to do this with you. And um, one of the most important questions we want to ask you right from the beginning is that you will keep asking questions. You do have a chat function, you do have a Q&A function, and um, we'll try to answer all your questions at the end of the webinar um, as, as much as possible. Obviously there are certain time limits, but um, we'll try to get um, back to, to all questions you have. Um, coming back to the organization of this webinar, just to give you a brief overview, we're gonna cover the upper face. Um, Dr. Margara is then going to give us a little insight into how he uses the higher core portfolio to treat the glabella and the periorbital lines. We'll then move on to mid-face anatomy, a little bit of aging of the mid-face as well, before we um, get further insights from Dr. Rees, um, how to use the genital portfolio for cheek augmentation. And then as the last part, we're obviously gonna cover the lower face and get some more information from both Dr. Rees and Dr. Margara, how to use both genital and higher core portfolio for the jawline, chin, lips, and the perioral lines as well as the nasolabial folds. So we're really excited to share this with you. Um, from my side, also big thank you to the organizer of this webinar, obviously to the whole bioscience team, but especially Anna, um, who has put so much effort into to bringing us all together today. Bioscience is, I think, a really exciting company um, that offers us a really broad portfolio of products. Um, since 2001, which is more than 20 years, um, they're working in the field of aesthetic medicine. Um, they allow us to use products of the high standards, um, which, which at the end of the day benefits definitely patient safety, but also the efficacy of our treatments. We'll come back later to this. So um, I think this is going to be a really interesting session. Um, we're going to start now with the um, first presentation about the anatomy of the upper face. I'm going to quickly ask my um, technician to put up the presentation. Here we go. Um, as um, I've just introduced my, my two um, co-chairs of the session, just a word about me. My name is Konstantin Frank. I work at the Ocean Clinic in Marbella. And um, kind of my passion, but also um, part of my job these days is um, the facial anatomy. And uh, I've been working together with uh, Bioscience for um, a couple of years right now. And I'm um, really excited to share um, our findings in anatomical research in the next one and a half hours. Before we really dive into the anatomy of the upper face, we really need to focus on the aging process. And I think this is something we all need to be aware of. Um, if, if we look into other fields of medicine, they always treat the pathophysiology if a patient comes in with a disease. Now, most of our patients that want to look younger don't actually have a disease, but um, they are aging. and We need to understand this aging process. We need to understand what happens as we get older in the certain facial parts to then ameliorate and rejuvenate those specific parts. Um, this is the reason why I always put a small aging um, part or chapter um, at the beginning of each um, zone that we will cover today. You can look at all those, um, say, famous people, actors, um, singers, celebrities. Um, you will find a common theme. If you look into their upper face, you can see how, first of all, forehead lines have formed, vertical labella lines have formed, and then also a certain skeletonization of the upper face has occurred. Now, you can see this right here quite nicely in this male, but also in this president, Joe Biden. If you look into the temporal region, you can see how this temporal concavity really increased. We also had a change to our skin envelope as the vertical glabella lines and forehead lines have formed. Now, we can do find this in, in different ethnicities. Right here also with Morgan Freeman, who once had a really smooth forehead and um, really nice volumized temples ending up with a really skeletonized um, upper face right here. And again, very static, very strong forehead lines. Here an example um, where you can also see or basically not see 
because she used her hair, how the temples have changed. And if you look at her, I think we can all agree that she's the one who aged the best. Why? Because she covered her upper face to such a tremendous part with her hairstyle. So at the end of the day, this is something we shouldn't forget about that we treat the upper face accordingly, not also in the vertical labella line region and forward line region, but also for the temples. Now to do this, we need to understand, as I said, the aging process. And um, the skeletonization of the upper face is mainly driven by a loss of volume of the bony calvaria. So males lose about 70 milliliters, females lose about 60 milliliters as they get older. We published this in a static surgery journal a couple of years ago. So you have to imagine that um, the skull shrinks down like a balloon. And this causes the overlying soft tissue layers to descend. They're not descending themselves or by itself, but because the support of the bone is taken from them. And um, you can also see that in the upper face, obviously the permanent contraction of the frontalis muscles adding to the formation of static and also dynamic forehead lines. So those two processes really play into what we can then observe in elderly people. Obviously, as I said, temporal concavity, we do have an eyebrow ptosis in many patients, not because the eyebrow per se is sagging or falling down, but because the loss of volume and the calvaria is missing. We do have a certain retraction of our forehead as we get older, and then obviously formation of static vertical glabella lines and static forehead lines. Receding hairline, as you can also see in my examples, definitely also a sign of um, increasing age in the upper face. However, we can't really treat this um, with soft tissue here, so we're not going to cover this. To get a brief overview of the anatomy of those uh, specific regions, um, I brought a couple of slides. And I would like to start with the temple because I think in the temple, you can get great results by um, adding volume to those parts. However, you need to be aware that there is a really specific arrangement of layers and you need to hit the right layer to stay safe and to stay efficient when it comes to the ameliorization of temporal hollowing. Now, obviously our first layer, there is a theme that we will come back quite many times this webinar is the skin. And below the skin, you can find the superficial, the subcutaneous fatty layer. And this is a relatively avascular layer. So if you're using a filler with a low G prime, you can perfectly spread it using a cannula in this subcutaneous fatty layer, as long as the filler does not have too much lifting capacity or the skin is too atrophic in your patient. Then if we flip this over, we can see a fascia, which probably most plastic surgeons do know. It's the superficial temporal fascia and it encompasses the superficial temporal artery. Now, if we flip all of this over, we can actually get into a really nice plane to distribute our film. That's loose areola tissue. It's basically a small layer connecting the superficial temporal fascia with the deep temporal fascia. Now, in this layer, you only have small, tiny attachments between those two parts, and those are um, retinacular. So if you glide with your cannula through this layer, this becomes a really nice plane to to basically deposit your soft tissue filler and get a nice volumization of the temple. Now the deep temporal fascia is composed of two lamina, a superficial and a deep lamina. And the superficial lamina encompasses the superficial temporal fat pad, which can become a little bit dangerous because it encompasses most of the branches of the frontal um, branch of the facial nerve and also the zygomatical temporal vein, which we also call sentinel vein. Then, um, Furthermore, we do have the deep lamina of the deep temporal fascia. And this deep lamina of the deep temporal fascia is covering something which we call the deep temporal fat. Pad. So you do have a superficial temporal fascia and the deep temporal fascia, and in between the superficial temporal fat pad and the deep temporal fat pad. And the deep temporal fat pad is basically a cranial extension of the fat body of Bichat in the mid face. So if you inject right here with a needle and are not in contact with the bone, but within the deep temporal fat pad, the filler might migrate into the mid face. And um, this is causing um, some problems, obviously, not only for an aesthetic reason, but also with the filler being on top of the macero. Many patients are reporting about pain after injections into the temporal region if the filler is not placed correctly. Now, last but not least, if we flip over the temporalis muscle, we're looking straight on the periosteum. We do have two arteries here, the anterior and posterior deep temporal artery. Be aware that those are not always running with a distance of one and a half to 2.5 centimeters posterior of the lateral orbit. Um, this was proposed for quite a long time and um, thus the gunshot technique was advocated as a safe injection technique. Recent research has shown that those arteries can be much more proximity to the lateral orbit. So um, I can only advise you if you um, inject into this region to try to um, at least use an ultrasound 
um, or perform aspiration. Um, going once over through this layered arrangement, as I said, we do have a superficial fatty layer, we do have a superficial and deep temporal fat pad, which are separated by superficial and deep temporal fascia, which can be seen right here. And then we have our temporalis muscle covering the anterior and the posterior deep temporal arteries. So when you inject, be aware that the superficial temporal artery is running within layer three, the superficial temporal fascia and the anterior and posterior deep temporal artery are running within the depth of the temporal concavity and are hard to predict in their course. Now, um, something I brought you because um, we often get asked, how do, you, how do you actually decide to inject superficially or deep? And this is a little bit more clinically. Um, is there a big difference? Yes, obviously there is a big difference. And uh, we try to get um, on the ground of this. If you inject with a gunshot technique deep, I'm not sure that um, everybody does this, but those of you who do know that it can be a little bit hard to persuade the patient to put as much volume as would be actually needed, also obviously for economic reasons. So we try to compare how much surface effect you actually get from injecting deep and um, from injecting superficially. We did this in uh, 17 patients and 19 cadaveric specimens, and um, the live subjects were actually followed up for 12 months. And then we calculated how much volume we actually get um, and uh, divided this by the actual volume injected and ended up with something that we call surface volume coefficient. And it was really interesting to see that um, it took a significantly more product um, when we injected deep um, compared to when we injected subdermally. And then also we found a much better um, surface volume coefficient, i.e. a better efficacy of the product when we injected superficially than deep. Now, obviously we can't tackle everything in the temporal region um, with the superficial injection technique. We sometimes need to give back volume, but keep in mind that, especially if you have an economically conscious patient who can't spend um, as much on, on, on treatment as you would uh, probably need, that a superficial injection might be a little bit more beneficial. This can be also seen in those three um, dimensional surface imaging techniques with the classical fanning technique and here with the periosteum bolus technique. Um, we're quickly going to cover the, cover the forehead right now um, before I'm going to hand over to Andrea. Um, obviously, forehead is, I think, one, one main indication for the toxin injections, but also with fillers, we can um, get great results here. Um, again, we have to think about our layered arrangement to be aware of the arteries that are running in, um, in this very specific region. And um, obviously, we do have a subcutaneous fatty layer. And in many, many, many patients, you can see this actually, um, often, um, if they have an atrophic skin, we do have those paramedian or paracentral forehead veins that are emerging and running along the forehead. If we flip over the superficial um, fatty layer, we can already see a little fascia covering the frontalis muscle. And um, basically, in between this fascia of the frontalis muscle and the skin, we do have or we do observe the formation of static forehead lines. So um, those static forehead lines are not something that is caused by, by loss of volume in the depth, but rather by um, repetitive contraction of the frontalis muscle, as I mentioned before. And um, this is basically the layer where you can augment and ameliorate um, those lines. Now, something important to, to be added right here is obviously that we do have vessels in this region. And then um, we do have the supratrochlear, supraorbital, and um, sometimes even superficial temporal artery in those regions. And they are emerging from deep to superficial as we move from caudal to cranial. So those arteries are becoming more superficial um, as, as we move up. And uh, they're basically also trespassing those um, ligaments right here, the superior, middle, and inferior frontal septum. And um, those are really important if you want to give back volume in the forehead, um, especially a technique performed in Asia um, quite frequently. You enter with the cannula from the lateral temporal crest and then advance in a medial direction with the cannula to replenish um, the volume down there to get a more convex forehead. Just be aware that the resistance that you actually might occur are those ligaments right here spanning from superior to middle to inferior. And um, those are actually ligaments that suspend the frontalis muscle between skin, superficial fat, and also periosteum. So if there's some resistance, this is nothing to be afraid of, but rather just to be conscious of. Last but not least, glabella. Um, definitely an indication which we can prevent perfectly with uh, toxin at young age, but as we get older, often with patients who are naive to botulinum toxin injections, develop those um, moderate to severe vertical glabella lines. 
and uh, then often we need to inject soft tissue fillers there. Now, for me, and this is really important, um, the injection should be performed very superficially. I'm Carissa Andrea is going to do this in a couple of minutes, but um, the reason for this is that we're in close proximity to vessels, which we actually do not want to um, inject. Um, the three vessels that we do have in the glabellar region is the dorsal nasal, supratrochlear, and supraorbital artery. We can see them quite nicely here. Um, in a second, right here, you can see them emerging. So if you inject deep, those arteries are running on top of the periosteum and then switching more superficially as we move cranial. Um, but just be aware that very superficial injections should be performed because they are, as I said, terminal branches of the ophthalmic artery. And if you kind of cause an embolization of those arteries in a retrograde injection towards the central retinal artery, your patient can, patient can become blind. So really important to stay superficial here. Now, um, to recap the danger zones before we head over in the temporal region and to impose your deep temporal artery, superficial temporal artery, um, and then also in the forehead and glabella region, supratrochlear, supraorbital artery to a certain extent, and the superficial temporal artery. And um, if you keep those in mind, if you are aware of their layered arrangement, you can perform really safe and really efficient um, treatments there. So I'm really happy to hand over now to Andrea. Andrea, stage is yours, um, shows your treatment um, protocols for, for this upper phase. Thank you very much, Konstantin. Hello all. Thank you for being with us. I can uh, start with my presentation. It's okay. 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 First of all, we have to understand that we must uh, understand the rheology to um, identify the procedure and the products that we can use in the phase. If we have a uh, um, high G prime, we have a lot of lifting effect, but we have to stay in the deep tissue. Particle size are very important. Small particles uh, are used in the phase. Larger particles are used in the body. The uh, G prime is important to understand the elastic response, the firmness, the lift capacity, the durability of the product, the viscosity, and the swell, it, it, uh, swelling factor too, to understand uh, what we are using in the phases. In uh, bioscience, we have uh, a lot of uh, product, very good product that could cover all uh, the needs of the aesthetic uh, med doctors and uh, plastic surgeons too, to enhance uh, the um, quality of the face of our patient, the quality of the, um, of the skin too, because we have to remember that uh, fillers, uh, hyaluronic acid, stimulate uh, the uh, quality of the skin, stimulating fibroblasts in producing uh, collagen, uh, hyaluronic acid, endogenous hyaluronic acid, and also elastin. Uh, we, have, we start with fine, then we move uh, with leaps, fill in phase, growing in the, um, in the, in the G prime and also in the um substance uh, in the consistence of the filler starting with the yakorp fine this is a, a product very um very light it's not it's a not cross linked hyaluronic acid it must be used on the surface of the skin so it's uh, indicated to inject this uh, product in the epidermis and uh, it helps in uh, enhance the glowing effect, uh, enhance the elasticity and hydration in the skin of our patients. Where we can use it uh, most? Maybe it's uh, more indicated in the periorbital line, the superficial wrinkles, and also in the neck. It's a product that uh, 
it's not uh, cross-linked, so it will not um, have a long duration in the skin. And uh, um, but it's very important to enhance the the glow of the of the skin. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Perfect. In this patient, you can see that uh, I've used it in the periorbital wrinkles. Uh, she is a young, uh, she's 45 years old uh, lady, and uh, she had uh, this little wrinkle, very superficial wrinkles, in the lateral part of the, of the eyes. Um, I, well, I think and I prefer to use the uh, botulinum toxin, but uh, this patient mm, was not so uh, happy to, to, to be treated with uh, this toxin. And uh, so we tried to uh, reduce uh, these, uh, these wrinkles using the, um, the hyaluronic acid, the fine, and uh, we reached a very good result. Obviously, she was aware that she had to repeat this treatment in during the time. But remember what I said before, stimulation by hyaluronic acid, by injections, um, helps uh, the skin to improve the extra matrix, extracellular matrix. So increasing also the production of collagen. So the results could last also more and more uh, in time. Um, growing in the consistency of the of the product, we have the Yacorp fill. This is a, a superficial filler because it's indicated in for superficial and medium wrinkles. Uh, it's also indicating the periorbital and the perioral area, but for deeper uh, wrinkles than the, the, those we have uh, seen before. Why? Because it's a non cross it's a combination between a non-cross-linked hyaluronic acid, two milligrams, and cross-linked hyaluronic acid, 18 milligrams. So in uh, every milliliter, we have 20 milligrams of hyaluronic acid, but it's biphasic. So um, we can uh, use it in the mid dermis and we can treat this area. Um, maybe it's something that you uh, could uh, say uh, mid dermis is too deep for the glabella area. Yes, it's. Uh, I think that it's a little bit too risky, and uh, I don't uh, uh, invite you to do it. Uh, so, 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 so freely. Okay, uh, but uh, I did it staying very superficial and using very, very few molecules of uh, hyaluronic acid uh, in each injection. I, I did a, a retrograde technique and uh, I just injected in the wrinkle. I, um, remaining very superficial, you are far from the infratrochlear uh, artery, so you try to avoid any risk of uh, uh, complication. But it's a very expert uh, um, treatment. treatment for Thank you so much. I think this is a really, really important um, point you just made, Andrea, uh, especially considering the, the increasing numbers of blindnesses. Um, before we head over to mid-phase, and you will then continue with um, your talk on lips, perioral lines, nasolabial fold, um, can you can you give us a quick um, take on your opinion if aspiration should be performed when injecting the glabella lines? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, it's very discussed. It's um, I think that uh, in my experience, I at the beginning I was doing uh, very very often, actually. I do it only when I'm in the risky area. And why? Because not every time you aspire with your syringe, you are sure to be uh, to, to avoid to be in uh, an artery or in a vessel. And uh, this is a um, uh, false negative 
okay so um and it's uh, I, I read read uh, i don't know where but i don't remember but it was a uh, half and a half percent uh, times for uh, um to to find uh, false negative or uh, true um true positive uh, so i don't think uh, uh, that is a very very sh that we um, that if we aspire we are sure to avoid any risk to avoid to be in the artery or in a vessel but but it's very important to do it uh, because uh, we have to uh, even if we don't believe too much in this uh, uh, technique in this uh, maneuver i think it's important that in the case we are in and we um, find it uh, we, we we did what we have to do and uh, so don't uh, inject uh, too uh, freely don't inject uh, too happy uh, as uh, e and easy like um, like doing a, a very no risk uh, uh, technique but uh, try to be always sure try to be uh, understand anatomy and study anatomy uh, before you showed very very well the tricky point the uh, very risky point the danger zones where we have to um, to pay a lot of attention because uh, in case we have a problem in case we we inject in a in a vessel it's it's a very big uh, it's a mess no, I'm, I'm absolutely with you and I completely agree, uh, agree with you Andrea um, I think even that we know that aspiration might not always be be uh, giving us the, the the truth at the end of the day. Um, I still perform it with uh, every single injection I do with a needle. Um, obviously not for cannula, um, but for needle I do for the same reason as you mentioned it. Um, it, it might not give us give us the, the complete truth, but at least we try to to find it. Um, so thank you so much. I'm really um, looking forward to your talk about lips and nasolabial fold. And thank you so much, Andrea. Um, before we will continue with definitely, I think, one of the most challenging parts um, when it comes to um, basically treating the aged face and also not only treating the aged face, but uh, making the face more beautiful. Um, I want to give you some background on the anatomy of the middle face. Now, we often have to ask ourselves, why is, why is the mid face such a complicated structure? And um, it took me some time to, to actually find a good answer to this. And it was given by colleagues um, that um, dealt quite a bit with evolution. And if you look at how we evolved basically from a monkey to a human being, um, you can see that our midface was more and more compressed. So all those structures that you do find right now in, in a very plain part of our face have been in an elongated part of your face for quite some, some 10,000 to 100,000 of years. So this is what makes the midface so complicated. However, using our layered approach, I hope that we can make it a little bit easier for you. Again, before we really kind of step into this, I want to go one step back. How do we age in the mid face? What happens? Well, we spoke already about changes in the bone in the upper face, how our calvaria shrink down, how this kind of affected all the overlying soft tissue layers. Now, in the mid face, we do have something similar. It's a clockwise rotation of the maxilla, at least if we look at it from the right side. What happens is that the maxilla turns in an anterior manner in the cranial part, and in a posterior manner in the caudal part. So you have to imagine that all the soft tissue layers that are kind of attached to the bone right there by ligaments, by the orbicularis retaining ligament, by the sagomatic cutaneous ligament, they start to fall down like this flag attached to the Tower of Pisa. So imagine the Tower of Pisa falling down and down and down, then also this flag is falling down. So we're speaking about the descent of soft tissue in the mid face. Yeah, that's true, but the actual problem, at least to a big extent, is the um, turn of the maxilla. Now it's not only the maxilla that turns in this clockwise manner, clockwise rotation, but also the orbit. The orbit kind of is absorbed in the supramedial and infralateral extent as we get older. So this actually also has an implication for upper face, um, but rather for toxin. If you think about the origin of the corrugator muscle right here at the supramedial end, um, and now having this resorb, the origin will move on top of the eyebrow, while in younger individuals, this is much lower. But for the mid face, this also has an implication because as we're losing kind of bony support in the lower part of our eye, we are also kind of creating 
um, an infraorbital hollowing, and not only an infraorbital hollowing, but also um, worsening of the teardrop deformity. Now, when we speak about the mid phase, obviously fat comes into play. Um, we need to be aware that there's a superficial fat and a deep fat, which is separated by something called SMAS, the superficial muscular apneurotic system. And um, interestingly, um, you, need to, you need to be aware that those two different um, types of fat behave completely differently as we get older. Now, in the superficial fat, we do have small compartments, and this is the superficial nasolabial fat compartment, medial, middle, lateral fat compartment. Then we have a chin compartment and a jaw fat compartment. Now, those are actually not losing volume as we get older, but two of them are descending. And it's the superficial nasolabial fat compartment and the superficial jaw fat compartment. Both of them are descending as we get older. And this kind of plays into this development of an accentuated nasolabial fold and formation of jowls, which we will speak later on again when we talk about the mid phase. Now, this is um, actually a cadaver from a study we published in Plastic Reconstructive Surgery together with my dear friend Tilo Schenk and Sebastian Kodofana. Um, six years ago already, um, but this was kind of a game changer when we thought about the behavior of the superficial nasolabial fat compartments and how we have to treat our patients. And you can see that actually really only the superficial nasolabial and the jaw fat compartment are descending with a significant um, influence by age. However, and this is really interesting, we do have some patients with the double jowling. Um, this is the superficial medial cheek fat compartment. This is a middle cheek fat compartment. This is the only compartment which kind of reacts to an increased BMI. So actually those um, double jowls are not caused by age, but rather caused by obesity. However, you can tell your patients that for, for obvious reasons. Now, if we deflect this mass and look into our deep fat compartments, we can see that the suborbicularis oculi fat pad, deep median, deep lateral cheek fat compartments, fat body of Bichat and roof are actually losing volume as we get older. So the physiological way to rejuvenate is actually to give volume deep right on top of the periosteum to replenish those deep fat compartments. Speaking about layers and uh, where we have to inject superficial super um, deep, I again want to split this mid phase into an infraorbital, into a medial and lateral cheek part. And then in the infraorbital region, we need to be aware that the skin is the thinnest we can find in the entire body. Um, I asked my illustrator of the book that we're gonna publish hopefully quite soon. Um, to really draw this plastic stick behind the skin that it seems translucent because it really is that way. Um, you will see this later on in the quick video. And then we have a really thin layer of fat, if at all, and then immediately the muscle, the orbicularis ocular muscle. In elderly individuals, sometimes in this upper part, there is no fat, there's just the muscle. And this muscle is kind of penetrated by a vein, the facial vein, or as we call it, the angular vein in this part, which pierces below the sagomaticus minor and major muscle and separates the medial and the lateral deep cheek fat compartments, and then accompanies the orbicularis retaining ligament and the sagomatic cutaneous ligament, which fuse to form the tear trough ligament. Now, if we flip this over, we are already at the bone, and you can see quite nicely here that there's only a small sheet of muscle separating our skin from the bone. So you're quite in close proximity to the bone, obviously also painful region due to the emergence of all the nerves from the supraorbital and infraorbital parade. Speaking about the mid phase, we again need to go back to this idea of superficial and deep fat compartments, right? We do have a quite thick fatty layer um, of superficial fat on top of the SMAS in the medial um, part of our face. And the relevant compartments here are obviously the superficial nasolabial fat compartment and the superficial medial cheek fat compartment. The lateral cheek fat compartment is not so important because we don't really inject superficially right here on the lateral sigoma, but rather go deep into the suborbicularis oculi fat pad. The soup is like a banana extending right here from the more or less pupillary line and then extending laterally on top of the sigoma. You can see this quite nicely here. This upper part here below orbicularis ocular, below SMAS is the SOOF. We then do have a facial artery and facial vein below the SMAS, which goes over in the platysma. This is really important to understand that basically the SMAS in the mid face is the platysma in the lower face and the superficial temporal fascia in the upper face. And you can see that as we flip this over, all those um, bigger structures are running below it. Now, obviously also the muscles are becoming more superficially once we get to the medial part of our face. They're quite deeply anchored in the lateral part, but they need to become superficial. Why? Because they need to either insert into the modulus or nasolabial fold to allow or facilitate expression of emotions. Something really important I want to point out um, 
is um, that the facial artery and facial vein are not running parallel to each other. This is one of the biggest misconceptions. Um, it's always shown in so many anatomy books that they are next to each other. This is completely not true, okay? The facial vein is always posterior of the facial artery and the facial artery often ends as superior labial artery. We oftentimes do not have an angular artery in many individuals because the midface is supplied by the infraorbital artery. If we do have one, and this is from a recent publication, we um, also published with a um, few colleagues from uh, Russia actually back then, um, this artery was running lateral of the nasolabial fold. Um, 2021, we published this in the Static Surgery Journal. And while we can't tell you the exact depth of the artery, if it's superficial or if it's deep, you need to know that it is always running lateral of our nasolabial fold, which is quite good news. With the exception that it often fuses with branches of the intraorbital artery in the deep piriform space. And you can see this quite nicely. This is actually the section performed by uh, one of, of the greatest anatomists, um, Dr. or Professor Hee Jin Kim. Um, you can see how the facial artery then fuses meaning in the piriform space, which we love so much for giving back volume in this upper trigonum. But be aware that there's a nasal branch of the infraorbital artery running right into this um, part. Now I brought a little video, which I would like to show very quickly to you and comment on this. Um, as we are progressing this webinar. As I told you, if we flip over the skin, we can see then the orbicularis oculi muscle. Um, and you see there's barely any fat. Um, there's no fat at all covering the orbicularis and we can actually see the forceps behind the skin. It is that thin, it's the thinnest skin we can find in our body. And this kind of emphasizes why we need to be so careful when we treat the infraorbital region of the tear trap. Now, if we flip over the superficial nasal labial fat compartment, parts of the matter fat pad, we can already see some orbicularis ocular muscle. And as I told you, the facial vein. This right here is the levator labi superioris and levator labi superioris aliquinasi muscle. But you can see that in this upper part right here, we do have no fat. There's just skin, muscle, and then already bare bone. So be really aware if you inject into this region that there's not much of um, a superficial fat that separates you. This right here is the sagomatic cutaneous ligament and the orbicularis retaining ligament. And we can see that below the orbicularis oculi muscle right here in the midface, we do have a space which is called the suborbicularis oculi fat pad and it is bordered by those two ligaments. They fuse right here. You can see we can't push any more immediately than this. And they then continue as a tear trough ligament towards our medial canthus. Now, um, also below here, we can see the first artery emerging. This is an infraorbital artery, and this is actually the palpebral branch that is moving in an ascending or cranial direction right there. And then um, even if you inject into the mid face deep, be aware that aspiration might be necessary. Obviously, the infraorbital artery is not as close to, let's say, the ophthalmic um, region as um, the supratrochia and supraorbital. Nevertheless, you should be aware of this. One last thing um, before I'm going to hand over um, to my to my staff co faculty. Um, there's so much uh, Dr. Nasser, Bruce Lopez, and Dr. Andrea Margaro can tell us clinically about this point. I want to mention the concept of the line of ligaments. This is a concept both really important for facial surgery, but also minimally invasive surgery. Because if you connect the ligaments of our face, which connect the periosteum to the skin, the temporal ligament is adhesion, the orbicularis retaining ligament, the zygomatic cutaneous ligament, and the mandibular ligament, you connect them, you get a separation of a medial and a lateral face. And this is clinical implications because you can see that as we actively try to move our face, most of the movement is medial of the line of ligaments. Why? Because the muscles are emerging here and we do have an active um, kind of control of this region. However, the lateral part um, is some uh, area of the face that we can reposition. This has been beautifully shown in a split face study, um, which has been performed by my uh, boss that we published in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology, lateral versus median injections. So Gabi Casabona came up with this idea. If we inject laterally first and then medially, we need less product to get the same result as if we start medially and then inject laterally. How does that work? It works as we can reposition a little bit of soft tissue right here. We then precondition the medial part and then need less volume because this is preconditioned and gives us a better projection. And actually she was true. You can see that both medial and lateral injections points were significantly smaller in terms of volume that we used if we started lateral first when compared to starting medial first. This kind of summarizes my anatomy part. I'm super happy to hand over to my um, co-faculty and I'm really curious about what we're going to learn 
um, with, um, with injection techniques of both Andrea and Lanzaret. Thank you so much. Thank you, Constantine. It was a great presentation, a very beautiful uh, slide with uh, beautiful uh, pictures. Uh, you have said uh, many, many things that uh, I wanted to, to say, me too, but a uh, uh, very important thing that, uh, that we have to focus is that um, actually, uh, normally in Europe, um, patients uh, are in search of a natural effect and natural appearance. So we have to uh, try to reposition, revolumize, and uh, lift the tissues, uh, staying in the more natural um, way. So uh, using ligaments, using the fat pads, uh, using the volume and trying to redistribute these volumes using a hyaluronic acid is uh, is very important to achieve the result these results uh, um, natural and uh, long lasting too i think um we move to the um, to my uh, slides okay and we move to another product of the iacorp port portfolio sorry uh, IACORP lips uh, is indicated, uh, as the name uh, say, uh, says, for lips augmentation, restoration of the lost volume, and also the contour. It's a combination between non-cross-linked hyaluronic acid and cross-linked hyaluronic acid. We have uh, 18 milligrams of uh, uh, hyaluronic acid in each milliliter, and uh, uh, it could be injected by a needle of 30 G. It's a product that could be injected in the mid dermis and also under the mucosa if you uh, stay in the uh, lips and try to uh, enhance the volume or and also uh, restore the volume and stimulate and hydrate the lips. In this case, um, you will see in this video, you will see what I think about uh, doing in a patient. In this patient, I've seen that uh, there's a dehydration, there's a lot uh, loss of uh, uh, projection of the upper um, lips, of the upper lips, sorry. And uh, the patient asked me to enhance the projection. So the blue uh, flesh are uh, saying this. And uh, also for the up, uh, down lip, down, sorry, for the um, inferior lip, the patient wanted to achieve an, an implementation of the projection. In this uh, view, you will see that we need to augment the projection of the philtrum and uh, to enhance the volume, to enhance the projection of the um, inferior lip, I will try to stay with multiple injection, but uh, with uh, not so many uh, point of entrance of the of the needle. I try to put some uh, product, uh, hyaluronic acid, all around, uh, trying to uh, distribute a, a good hydration on the whole um, lip, and uh, trying to put some more in the um medial part of these lips just to create some projection and to um enhance the volume of of the of the lips in an homogeneous way this is my this is what my patient asked as to me uh, a natural look iacorp face is another uh, product uh, and uh, it arrives uh, to us in uh, two formulation two milliliters per vial or one milliliter per vial uh, we have 22 milligrams of hyaluronic acid 20 cross-linked and two not cross-linked uh, it could be injected in the mid dermis and uh, we could use it in the face uh, um, sorry in the glabella area in the zygomatic and malaria area or in the nasolabial fall, pericommissural um, wrinkles, or also in uh, 
de, um, de Labio uh, Menton, uh, Mentoniera area. We could take a look to the ranges of... Uh, okay, this is uh, something that a lot of uh, uh, colleagues ask to me when I um, take my presentation. And, um, but it's something that I don't, uh, uh, that it's very difficult to, to answer because uh, how much filler do you put in each injection, in each area, in each uh, uh, point? I don't know. It depends on the clinic. It depends on the patient. It depends on uh, what do you see and where you put this product. If you stay um, in the dermis, really, up in the mid superficial dermis, you uh, have uh, um, an effect that is uh, increased by staying so superficially. If you go under the dermis, if you stay in the subcutaneous tissue, you lose the possibility to have the same result, um, the same lifting result in the, in the skin, in the dermis, because the, the tissue is less uh, compact. Okay, so. Uh, it's not so easy to talk about how much filler you put in each region, in, uh, in every region or in uh, every point. It's something that we, you, um, you will learn with your experience. You will learn, uh, and I learn every day with my experience, because the skin of our patient is not always the same. Um, I think that... Uh, Some, uh, uh, some patients could, uh, uh, are better responder to our treatments because uh, we um, could uh, find better tissues, okay? In a patient, in an older patient, uh, normally it's not so easy to find a good response in case of uh, lifting, in, in when you are searching for a lifting effect or we are searching for a volumization effect. So maybe I could be more precise with some, uh, some cases. In this patient, it's, uh, it's my uh, sample. I think that there are some problems in the nasolabial fold. There's a little problem here under the inferior lips in the commissural uh, area. But there's a bulging, a little bulging, just lateral to the, um, the, the commissural area because of the sagging of the skin, the initial laxity of the skin. There's another problem. There's a scar in the mental, mental region. And there was also a little uh, wrinkle on the glabella. Maybe we can see it better here. There's a bulging here and there, just on the opposite side, you can see the same. Okay, here you have to be very, very attentive when injecting. Don't move over the green area. Well, I don't move over the green area because if not, I create a chipmunks. And uh, I don't like to have these patients moving around in my town because it's very difficult to, uh, to reduce or to, to, to correct because maybe you can use a yellow days or uh, similar, but I don't like to correct uh, uh, reducing what I have injected. The nasolabial folds are very, very superficial, have a very superficial uh, wrinkle. So they could uh, be treated but staying really superficial in the der superficial dermis. The scars, the scars could be treated staying in the dermis too, and uh, maybe repeating the treatments uh, after two, three, four months, uh, depending on what happens in the, in, the, um, in the scar. Here, I treated this patient with fill. Do you remember Phil was a um, filler for the superficial and medium um, wrinkles? 
so could be positioned in the superficial and medium dermis, staying really attentive when you are superficial because maybe if you inject too much, it could be you could create a little bump. Okay, so in this area, uh, I choose. I've chosen to um, to use the fill because it was a dynamic area. So when you are in a dynamic area, uh, when where the patient moving uh, could create some wrinkle or um, little folds, etc., you have to use a very smooth and elastic product. So fill, I think, is perfect for this area and for treating this kind of uh, wrinkles. For the lips, I'm not a lip pusher, uh, lips uh, pusher, <laughs> because uh, I don't like, uh, and my patient uh, asked me for natural lips, as I said before. So this patient asked me uh, to uh, treat only the upper uh, lip, and I did it. I did it with uh, um, not uh, a complete uh, vial of lips, but uh, I think it was, uh, I don't remember, but it was... Uh, around 0 0.6 uh, milliliters. Um, and I achieved this result, okay, immediately. In the uh, picture, um, in the inferior picture, there's a control after two weeks. So it was very natural, it was very smooth, was not so much perfect for what she said and asked me at the beginning. Another patient, young patient, uh, she, ex she asked me to um, hydrate the inferior lips and uh, pushing a little bit more the upper lip, uh, creating um, a contour and uh, defining the contour, um, the contour area. So I did it with lips and uh, I stayed in the dermis, medium dermis, uh, trying to not inject too much, okay? And uh, it was uh, this was uh, the uh, result. Another view, as you can see, there's a. a I'm sorry, the pictures are not the same uh, in the same uh, perspective, but there's a little bit uh, increase of the um, effect of the um, projection effect, and. Uh, a natural look. Here you can see uh, the same picture of before where I used the, uh, the fill in the uh, wrinkles around and near the commissural area. As you can see, they are reduced, but you cannot see any um, molecule of hyaluronic acid too superficial, or you cannot see anything too rigid to uh, change the, um, the dynamism of this area. Another patient. In this case, I've used two uh, products. I used the, the lips to enhance the, um, the lips, the upper lips. So I redefined the contour border and a little bit also the volume, uh, creating a little increase of this volume. And I did also a rhino filler. I treated the nose with uh, Genefil DX, creating more projection on the point uh, and uh, of the tip, sorry, and a little correction also on the dorsum. Genefil uh, DX is a very uh, strong and uh, lifting uh, product strong because uh, it could support and it is a good G prime and uh, I use it in um, contouring creating contouring directly on the bone uh, trying to lift all the tissues uh, that are over the bone in this patient I did this on the zygomatic area and also on the mandible mandible I used the, the face product and also the Genefield DX. Maybe here you can see it better. I create some uh, um, projection with the Genefield DX on the bone and on the lateral part of the bone. Have you seen before the 
line of the retaining ligaments. I treated the lateral part and a little bit also there in the maximum projection point. And then I did the same also on the ang um, angle of the mandible. And then I used in the um, just under the dermis, the face filler to creating a little volume, a little um, surface of the volume with uh, hyaluronic acid to trying to cre uh, create a hydration and a little um, volumization, but very, very natural. You can see it better here. With the blue flag, um, blue arrow, I assigned the area in the angle of the mandible. And then also with face, I created more volume on the zygomatic area and also a little bit on the malar area. For the nasolabial folds, for the nasolabial folds, I used also the face. You can see there was a little, um, little wrinkle. It was not so deep, uh, but uh, it's a um, patient that had, have a little bit of laxity, starting laxity here. So uh, I treated also this area. You can see better here the projections. This is a full uh, face uh, treatment. Here I used uh, maybe all the portfolio. So feel, face, lips, and also genifil dx. With genifil dx, I tried to create more projection. I tried to create uh, more structure under the um, soft tissues. And then with face, I tried to create vol volumization of the, um, of the uh, fatty compartments uh, of the face, just under the dermis. As you can see, it had a good result in the end. In this patient, I used the fill. Uh, it was a great patient to stimu uh, stimulate the area and also to take every single wrinkle uh, of the barcode with uh, my needle. It was a little bit painful. We made some anesthesia, but uh, the result was great. And it was an old patient, so it was not so easy to achieve this result. As you can see there. And I put also a little bit of fine to stimulate more and hydrate the skin of the patient. And she was happy for this result. So uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, to terminate my slides, but I have some take home message to, um, to leave you. Try to perform all, all your treatments in a aseptic condition. Try to be very trained and study anatomy. Uh, always ask for uh, uh, rheology to the, product, um, to the agents that uh, can visit you from the companies. And uh, then Try to be very safe in what you do. Avoid complication is staying safe also for the surgeon. Here are some pro post-procedure recommendations. Uh, always uh, don't uh, ex avoid exposure to extreme cold or heat. Avoid messaging treated area for six hours. Physical activity also avoid this for six hours. Um, don't... Uh, Treat patients with chemical peel or laser for at least 14 days to avoid inflammation of the injection site. Some swelling could be normal, but uh, if you uh, have this kind of problems, maybe you can talk with your patient it's normal it's something that happens in 2012 um, could be resolved uh, by using heparin cream several lamps without infection you can use steroids anti-inflammatory but uh, always try to work in uh, aseptic conditions and you will have less complications thank you very much the stage is uh, again for Constantine, and thank you for your attention
Thank you, Andrea. This was a beautiful demonstration of so many concepts. Um, so we're really fortunate to, to have just um, been able to listen to you. I think there are many more questions coming up. So also a quick, um, let's say, call to our attendees. If there's anything you want to discuss after we've finished our lectures, um, you can type it in right away and uh, we'll be happy to, to answer this. Now, it's my, my great honor and great pleasure to welcome one of my Spain Spanish colleagues, uh, Dr. Nazar Ruiz Lopez, um, who will tell us about how she's treating the cheeks with Jennifer. Um, I think this is gonna be the perfect addition to um, the, the areas and regions we've just um, been seeing treated by Andrea. So Nazar, please go ahead and um, tell us about your take on how to enhance the mid cheeks. Hello everyone, I, I'm Nazareth Ruiz, I'm plastic surgeon, and when presentations go ahead, okay, I will start. I wanna talk to you about Genefil DX. Um, Andrea Margara uh, has talked about a bit about this product, but I, I wanna go more deep into this special product that for me is great for the treatment of the medium and inferior part of the face. Like I told you, I'm Nazareth. I'm a specialist in plastic and reconstructive surgery and in fashion and body aesthetic surgery. In the fashion line of bioscience, we can find different products inside Genafil. Genafil uh, have a non-gross leak hyaluronic acid that is called Genafil Fine that we will try, uh, we will use for hydration. We will have two different hyaluronic acids that are cross-linked that are used for filling. And we have a special one that is an hybrid hyaluronic acid that is called Genefil DX and what's uh, the principal item of this presentation. So with the fascia line, we can treat every part of the skin. With the fine, with a non cross leak one, we can treat the superficial part of dermis with fillers that are soft touch and soft fill that cross linked hyaluronic acid, we can fill the medium and the deepest part of the dermis. And with Genefil DX, we will treat only the deepest part of the skin and the periosteums right, with an injection in the supra periosteum plane. So what is Genefil DX? Genefil DX is a filler that is a combination of hyaluronic acid and dextranomer. The dextranomer is a glucan that makes a scaffold where the hyaluronic acid go inside. So it is uh, going to be a filler that it's big, big particles, and makes, and um, it avoids the migration of the products and it will have a long lasting effect. This is because the hyaluronic acid, which is inside the dextranomer, cannot be um, treated by hyaluronidasa from the uh, body or that we inject from outside. So it's a very good product, but it's a product that must be used for people that uh, have experience because we cannot dilute every part of the filler with hyaluronidasa. Other advantages is that this dextranomer makes a regeneration of the dermis because it mm, produces a collagen, type one collagen, okay? And it is a white filler so we are not going to have Tyndall effect. This is not very important because like I say you, said you before, is a product that we are going to use in a very deep plane. So we don't care about the Tyndall effect, but in some places where skin is very, very thin, it can be important. So I will talk about Genefil DX. I wanna talk about this uh, product in the treatment of the profile of the face the cheeks and in some minutes I will talk about the mandibular area. Like Dr. Constantin said before, with the agent in process we can see that there is a loose of a bone at every level in the face, but it's very important in the zygomatic area and in the mandibular area. So if we can have, if we want to have a youthful um, aspect, we need to have a very projective malar and zygomatic area. Every woman want to have a malar, zygomatic and malar area like El Zapataki. But we have another condition that, in, that are not um, related with uh, aging in process, like the vectors of the medial, uh, medial phase. 
So we can have a negative or positive vector, and these vectors will be related uh, with how we look and if we look joyful or not. A negative vector uh, means that our manner born is behind the line of the eye. So every structure of the eye, it's going to be in, in front of the malar bone. So we are going to have more um, bugs um, in the down part of the, of the leaves, and we're going to have a more marked um, tear through. In the positive vectors, it's not going to be this way. So we are going to um, get in older, better than if the people, people who have negative vectors. In name, it, you can say a man that have a negative vector. So it looks like the eye is in front of the malar and we can see the bugs and how uh, every part of the, the eye in the downside, it not, uh, doesn't look well. So to treat the malar area, uh, I make different injections. Like Dr. Constantin said before, I always treat before the lateral part of the face. Uh, why? Because if we make a reposition of the tissues in this part, we're going to use less product in the medial part of the malar area. I choose different points. In the lateral part, the injections are supraperiostical, so I do it with needle. And I choose two or three points along the zygoma. In women, I usually treat three points, and in men, usually treat only two. Because if we mark a lot this uh, part, we're going to feminize uh, the person. So I think in men, it's better not to put a lot of uh, filler in this place. In the medial area, in the malar area, I use normally two points and two different deep uh, of the product. I make a deepest uh, injection inside in, in, in the supraperiosteum place. And I make a more superficial one that is inside the medial malar fat path. That is the uh, video I show you during uh, this presentation. When I make the injection in the bone, I use needle and always we need to aspire because there is a lot of vessels in this in this uh, zone. So if you want to be safe, you need to do things okay. If you um, do something that is wrong, you are going to have problems. So if you're going to put the filler over the bone, you can use needle, but of course, uh, it's very important to be safe. So as part always. When I make the injection in the malar fat pad, in the medial malar fat pad, I use always um, canola. I do it because this place is a dangerous place because near are the, uh, the vessels of the, uh, the fascial vessels, and of course the infarbitary vessels. So uh, I prefer to use always canola. This canola is 25 years, no more thin, because if it's thinner, it's dangerous because it can act like it, like it was um, a needle and not a canola. So the risk or go inside a vessel uh, exists. So I prefer to use um, canola in this place. Okay. Now, so when I uh, make a middle uh, phase correction, like in this girl that has a um, negative vector in the middle area, I use always Genefil DX. In this uh, patient, we, uh, we have a very, very big improvement only with this filler and without any kind of surgery. So you can say it's spectacular because uh, she looks um, less tired. She looks um, more young. She's a very young woman, and, but now you, we can see the aspect is very, very good. So it's a safe filler, but you need to use it in the correct way. And of course, if we have an older people that this girl, we cannot, cannot do only the middle phase and that's all because the, uh, the aging in pro process acts in every part of the face. So it's necessary to treat every part if we want a really, um, a, a really improvement like there. 
we use the DX in the thigomatic uh, malar area and in the mandibular area. But you can see uh, an improvement of the skin quality. And this is because I use it only Genefield DX, but I use it in the most deep part of dermis, not only supraperiostical. In the cheeks, I use it in the, uh, in the dermal part, but in the deep uh, dermal part. So you can see how uh, collagenization of the skin uh, improves the aspect of, of our patient. So it's very safe, use it, Genefield DX, because it's a very good product. And that's all for the middle phase. And I will talk to you about this uh, filler for the mandibular area in, in some minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nazareth. Those are beautiful before and after um, pictures. And I think we can all agree that um, this was a perfect incorporation of anatomy of product technique to get such a nice result. Now, before we are almost at the end of this webinar and we've already covered one hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to take over now um, for, for one last time before I'm going to moderate a little bit the Q&A. So you're just a quick quick reminder to um, type in any question you have. Um, there are no stupid questions. Um, so um, you're more than invited to, to type your question right now. But um, before this and before I will um, hand over one more time to, to Nazareth, who will um, then tell us a little bit about lower face treatments. We're gonna treat the lower face anatomy in brief. Um, so obviously um, when it comes to aging again, this is no surprise to you. We are thinking about loss of bone and this loss of bone can be um, seen um, as also has been shown by, by Natsar beautifully in one of the slides. I don't know if you looked at the mandible by loss of volume right here at the mandibular angle. This is in the lower face. One of the main problems we do have then obviously also retraction of the mandible. Um, I'm not a maxillofacial surgeon, definitely not very familiar with dental processes, but also we do know that as the teeth are changing, this has a big influence on our entire perioral region. So be aware that not every change that you encounter in the lower third of the mm -hmm. face is a change you can um, treat with filler. Um, those of you who know Steve Cohen um, has done a beautiful post on this and educate your patients on this because you can see right here that this loss of bone volume is nothing you can substitute um, with, with hyaluronic acid. So be aware of the limitations to make the perfect use of this, this great tool that we do have. Now, obviously um, for fat, um, we've touched on this just as a little repetition. We do know that the superficial jowl fat compartment descends as we get older. Now we have to understand and see that all the perioral musculature is right inserting here into the skin to move our modulus, to move our lower face. And then we do have the platysma covering the deep fat, covering the super, um, the facial artery and facial vein that you will see later on. And then on top, the superficial jowl fat is kind of bulging. It's coming down as we get older and it is causing a disruptive jawline. And um, this is obviously something many patients want to have fixed. Um, again, be aware that right anteriorly here, you do have the mandibular ligament. And um, if you want to kind of build and create the jawline, you need to be aware that you can only add with filler, not subtract. So um, just as a little reminder, when we think about the jawline, um, we do have quite a plain, easy, straightforward anatomy in this region. This makes it beautiful. Why? Because there are five layers that are easily um, separated. We do have our skin as layer one. You can see that in the perioral region, we do have the um, dermal insertion of our perioral musculature as we remove the skin. And then more posteriorly, we do have our subcutaneous fat, our superficial fatty layer. And um, this is quite a big, thick layer that is lying on top of the platysma. This layer can be up to 0.5 centimeters in some patients. So definitely something where you can beautifully move and maneuver a cannula. Now it's really important to point out um, that this layer does not have any major vessels. The major vessels are below the platysma right here. So if we flip over the platysma, we can see the facial artery, we can see the facial vein. And also this is really important, the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. Why is this important? For the simple reason that if you insert your cannula too deep and start to manipulate the jawline, you can cause neuropraxia to your marginal mandibular branch. And this will cause a certain asymmetry in the movement of the perioral musculature, especially of the depressor angle the oris. So be aware that if you tackle the jawline, if you want to work with your filler in this region, use a cannula and stay superficial. Those are my two kind of recommendations. There are 
horrific videos in the internet of people doing the walk the line technique down on the mandible with a needle, um, even if they're not hitting the facial artery because they, their toes work and palpate it, there's still a high chance of hitting the facial vein. Um, obviously, this is not causing necrosis, but can cause severe hematoma in your patient discomfort. So I think staying in the superficial fatty there is um, a perfect plan to, to inject your filler. Um, here again, another dissection where you can actually see how the facial artery and the facial vein are curving from the, from the cervical area, from the neck part, on over the mandible and always covered by the platysma. So right there in the depth. I brought a little video for you um, to just um, see this in, in action. We deflect the skin and the superficial fat. We then kind of have a look on our here platysma, which um, is then continuous with the depressor angle, the orus muscle. You can see this quite nicely. And you can see that just like a blanket, this uh, platysm fibers are covering the facial artery, are covering the facial vein a little bit more posterior. We're going to see them in a second. You can see that this then really fuses also with the depressor angle, the orus. That's the facial artery right here. That's the facial vein right here posteriorly. And you can see that the diameter of the facial vein is actually a little bit bigger than the um, diameter of the facial artery. And then obviously in the most poor, more posterior part, you do have the masseter muscle. So be aware that if you insert your cannula right at the mandibular and you don't go too deep, you wanna stay on top within the superficial fatty layer and don't end up below where those major structures are waiting for you. When we speak about the chin, we also need to be aware of our vascular network down there. I think the chin is um, one of the most underrated regions. Um, luckily, it gains a little bit more attention um, the last um, couple of years. Why? Because we need to work on the profile of our patients as well. So what we call profiloplasty, finding this balance between projection of the tip of the nose, projection of upper lip, projection of lower lip, and projection of chin, they all should be in line with what we call the rickets line. This is where we can really put filler to use to create a little bit more projection right here in the lower face to elongate this. And a really nice side effect is what we call the jawline expansion mechanism is if you create more projection here, you're also smoothening the skin here. We do know this from face lift, uh, face um, from neck lift surgery. If we do a cut right here anteriorly, we can redrape the skin a lot. We don't, often don't need a cut behind the ear if we want to redrape the, the skin of the neck. So if we add a little bit more, you can see that this stretches out basically our, our length of skin that is covered right here and gives us a nicer jawline. So chin, definitely one of those areas you should take into consideration when I'm um, treating your patients. Be aware that the mental artery is much more lateral than you would think it is. We do know this from chin implant surgery. The mental artery emerges the mental foramen quite laterally here and then moves up towards the lower lip. And we do not only have the mental artery, this again, um, uh, a picture taken from one of uh, Heejun Kim's publications. You can see how we have a submental artery running over the chin. This one is much more medial and fusing in the midline with the contralateral submental artery and then also the inferior labial artery. So if you inject, my advice for you would be to stay as central in the midline as possible and to go down to the bone. The submental artery shows to be a little bit more superficial. Most of the arteries right here within this chin plexus are running more superficial. So deep injection is, um, is one of the safest ways to perform um, any kind of augmentation in, in the chin region. Regarding the muscles, you can see this quite nicely here. We also do not have any muscles in the midline. We do have two valleys of the mentalis muscle right here. We do have our depressor anguli oris muscles emerging then to the modulus in the lateral direction and the depressor labi inferioris muscle kind of originating from the depressor anguli oris muscle right here. So be aware that there are three muscles, but right here in the midline, the chances of hitting an artery or positioning your, your um, soft tissue filter within facial muscle where you actually do not really want to have it um, is, is the safest point. Now, um, something we already had covered by Andrea, I'm gonna um, throw in my, my two cents of anatomical knowledge right here at this place is definitely when we speak about lips, we need to know the anatomy. Now the anatomy of lips is actually not that hard. We do have a subcutaneous layer. We then do have an intramuscular layer and we do have a submucosal layer. And um, you can see that we also do have a dry and a wet mucosa. Um, often here, this is the, the dry part more or less, and then starts to become the wet part of the mucosa. So we have quite some landmarks. And um, interestingly, the superior and inferior labral artery run a majority of all times within 
the submucosal plane. So um, the submucosal plane is where we actually are expecting our inferior labial artery and our superior labial artery, but it can also run intramuscular. So the artery might run within the orbicularis oris muscle or sometimes even subcutaneous quite superficially here. So um, I think that also clinically, we can all agree on that um, the artery is running in majority of the time submucosal because we can actually palpate it, but be aware that um, we do have um, this potential course also in more superficial parts. And um, this is something to be, to be aware of, to keep in your mind. And then also those arteries are changing planes, right? So it's not always within the submucosal layer, but they can become more superficial. And while this is really important, an occlusion of the labial artery is often not causing a severe complication because uh, the lip is really well perfused if you inject too much, it might cause a retrograde um, issue. And um, sometimes even in the um, upper lip, we do have one picture here. Some branches are supplying our columella. And if you occlude them, the bolus is then kind of projected into the tip of the nose. This can cause trouble. Why? Because the arterial plexus right here in the tip of the nose is quite delicate. And occlusion of this can cause this already very susceptible tissue to ischemic damage. One more thing in terms of relation to the vermilion, the superior labial artery is in 100% of the times observed by us in an ultrasound investigation with almost 200 subjects within our vermilion. In the lateral parts, the superior and inferior labial artery are sometimes not within the vermilion of the lip, right? So they're still in the upper lip superior or in the lower lip inferior to our vermilion border. Why? because they need to find their way into the lip. However, in the midline, in 100% of the cases, you can expect the artery to run within the mucosa. Now, one last um, bit of advice, that was one last bit of observership, um, because this is uh, something we all need to be aware of. If we change the lips, we do have a huge impact on the perception of our patients, of their own self-perception, but also of the perception of other people. And uh, I don't know about you, so um, Nazareth comes from um, Gijon, she told me, um, I think Andreas from Rome, but correct me, or Milan, I'm not sure, we didn't talk about this yet, but I'm sure all of you have a, have a little restaurant or cafe in the city where you sit on a Saturday or Sunday, enjoy a nice glass of wine, and then you see somebody passing by with way too much lips, way too huge lips. And um, I loved about the lips and read it, that they were not overdone. So for us, the question was, how do we kind of differentiate between overdone and normal? And when does it actually kind of shift our gaze? So what we did was we kind of created different upper to lower lip ratios and different lip volumes, and then asked 200 people to look at those lips and rate those lips. Now you can see that this is a one-to-one -one ratio. This is a one to 1.6, one to two, and 1.6 to one ratio. So this is the only ratio where the upper lip is bigger than the lower lip. Now see what happens. This is actually the average um, gaze of the participants, you can see that as the lips get bigger and are kind of deviating from our 1 to 1.6, the gaze intensifies on those lips that we um, would consider as rather unattractive. And this is actually the truth. Those lips have been ranked as the most or at least unattractive or most ugly ones, while at the same time, the 1 to 1.6 have been rated as the most attractive. You can see that the gaze on those lips is actually not very very intense. So we quantified this, obviously, and there was also a significant difference between those lips. So not only if we speak about upper to lower lip ratio, but also to lip overall size, be aware that changing size and proportions of the lip of your patients is going to cause a huge impact on how their face is going to be perceived. You can see the shift right here from the eyes to the lips to the perioral region. So keep this in mind when you're treating your patients. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happily handing over to Nazareth right now, who will give us an overview of how she is tackling the lower face. Thank you so much, Nazareth. I'm really keen to, to learn from you for the last part of this webinar. So I will talk now about the treatment of the lower part of the face of the mandibular area. With the same product I talked before, that is Genefil DX. Remember that it's a mixture of uh, dextranomer and gyalidocinic acid. It's an ivory. Okay, so we are going to use this product in the more deeper, in the, the deepest uh, parts of the skin and supraperiostical. Okay, I'm trying to do it 
Hello. Yes, okay. So this is the same image I showed you before. Uh, you can see the reduction of the bone, like Constantine Frank has said that it, it was a, a splendid um, presentation. So you can see how in the uh, lower part of the face, you can see a reduction of the bone, a very important reduction. This is um, the principal cause of the jowls and uh, the, that we don't have a really good um, Differential, differentiation between the face and the neck. The uh, cervicofacial angle is loose. So this area is important in the uh, aging in process, but of course it's important in young people because every man wants to have the mandibular of the Superman because this area is very attractive in uh, men. So we are going to treat this area for uh, people that are old and for men that want a masculine initiation and for women that want to uh, improve the cervical uh, fascial angle. The first uh, part I treat is the uh, chin. I make uh, augmentation of the chin in two kinds of patients. One patient that have a retrosion of, uh, of the mental bone. In this uh, kind of patients, I inject the filler in the anterior part of the chin, always supraperiodic and always with only a puncture in the middle to avoid the muscles and to avoid the vessels. But we can use this filler in another parts of the, uh, of the chin, uh, chin area. We can put it in the angle or we can put it in the down part. If we use the inferior part, we are going to make an elongation of the mandible. So in this uh, kind of patient, we are going to redrape every skin in this part. So we are going to improve the jaws without making an anterior projection of the chin. So in a chin of that basement, like we can see here, we are going to make an injection in the central part, superperiostical, in the middle to avoid vessels and muscles. And I go, I'm going to use Genafil DX. In this patient, he wanted a masculinization. So I inject this product in the angle and in the uh, in other parts of the mandible. But I want to show you the advancement, advancement of, the, of the team. If I inject the mandible, I inject different parts of, the, uh, of this zone. I inject the angle always in the uh, supraperiostical, and I can do it in two places. I can do it in the posterior part. I do it in women because it's going to rewrite the skin. But if I want a masculinization, I'm going to put it in the ex uh, lateral part of the angle. That's because we want to project the mandible laterally, but I never do this in women. In this part, I use needle always, and I absorb, and I uh, always do an injection supraperiostical. I uh, mark the mandible uh, always, and I mark the part of the jaw because I'm not going to inject anything there for two reasons. The first reason is that I have uh, plenty of tissues there. Everything is, um, is falling down in this place, so I don't want to put more filler in this place. And this place is the place where we are going to find the uh, fascial vessels. So it's a dangerous place to inject. So I usually inject uh, in the anterior part of the jowl and near the chin uh, with a little deposit of filler, like you can see in the image, in a supraperiostical plane, little one in this place. If I want, to mark the other part of the mandible, I always use canola, canola of 25 Gs, and always in a superficial uh, part, because in the deep part, we're going to have a structure that is, uh, are dangerous to be near, like the marginal area, uh, marginal nerve, or the vessels. If I put the filler superficial, I'm going to mark a lot of the mandible. Like uh, Dr. Constantine said before in the temporal area, if we use the product very superficial, we are going to get more 
results with less product. So I reserve the supraperiostical injection for the chin, for the angle, and for the anterior part of the uh, jowl. And in the rest of the mandible, I use this uh, subcutaneous in the deep part of the, uh, the dermis, of course, with canola. This is the injection. I, I didn't know if I put it before. So the profiloplasty, not perfiloplasty, I'm sorry, uh, it can be used in men, in women, and in young, and in old people. In this case, I can we can see a woman. A woman like wanted to uh, recover the facial uh, facial neck angle, the big facial angle. So only with the injection of Genefil DX in the chin, like I told you before, not in the anterior part, in the inferior part to make an elongation of the chin and in the angle and subcutaneous in the other part of the mandible, we have a, a beautiful woman that don't, that looks uh, thinner mm, and have a very beautiful cervical facial angle only with Genefil DX. And we can get masculinization. You can see here only with Genefil DX, we can have a very, very good mandible. Of course, you can um, like it or not, because this is something that people have a, an own uh, perception of themselves. So this man wanted a very marked mandible. So we make an injection of the eggs in the chin, in the inferior part of the chin, in the wrinkle that he has in, in the inferior part of the lips, because this is the one part that have um, less bone with aging in the angle and of course in the mandible. So we can have very nice results. So this is what I wanted to, to tell you about the X. It's a very safe product, very special product because I think there is nothing similar uh, in other brands. So uh, you can have very good results, but always with safety, please. And that's all. Thank you so much, Nazareth. I think this was a really impressive demonstration of how to, to treat the lower face, beautiful results. Um, also like with, with Andrea, we, we do have a couple of um, questions um, and um, I would um, start with the first one. Maybe we can, can answer it together. Um, Nusra Yasmin um, asks us, what entry points do you recommend for the temple using a cannula? Um, I don't know about, about you guys, for me, it really depends. Um, most of the time I use a mid zygoma approach and then work my way up if I want to tackle the anterior temple. Um, I'm not so much a fan of the um, superior axis um, in, um, in people who do have a lot of facial hair because my cannula is then scrubbing over the hair if I don't use a foil. I do feel quite confident to um, insert either subdermally or in the intrafacial plane coming from this approach. Obviously, there's a good reason if you say if you're not that experienced with the temple yet and don't know which, which layer is the right one, how it should feel if you don't have verification with ultrasound, then tilting in from the temporal crest going down to the bone and then tilting it over and going down is definitely a safer way. Um, for the posterior hairline, I do not inject um, any soft tissue filler there, to be honest, um, because um, I think this is, this is rather than already a surgical indication if you want to lift that much. Um, how I don't know. How about how about you guys? How about you, um, Nazareth? How about you, Andrea? Do you have any approaches that are different to this for the temple? I usually approach the temporal area from the zygoma always. In the zygoma, if I want a superficial feeling, I usually you uh, divide this area in four, and I make a superficial filler in the inferior both and in superior lateral. In, if I want a deep injection, I only use this part and I do it with needle. So if for the inferior part and superlateral part, I always use cannula and from Thigoma. I'm 100% with you. Gunshot technique, only very cranial and um, anterior, otherwise you're you're going to end up anywhere. Andrea, anything to, to add about this? No, because uh, I do the same uh, as you and uh, I think it in this uh, in this area we have to be safe and the most important thing that we can do is trying to follow your advices so it's uh, i completely agree with you 
Perfect. Then um, I think we have a have a good um, answer for for Nusra. Nusra always um, also asks us um, what our thoughts on using a cannula for the Vermilion borders are. So personally, I don't use the cannula for the Vermilion border. I use it for the mucosa. I go to the separation of dry and wet mucosa. I then retrogradely insert my filler to give deep volume to replenish. But there are two reasons why I'm not using it for the Vermilion border because obviously it seems tempting, right? Just put it up to the filtrum, retract. The reason why I don't use it is um, that I'm quite afraid of filler migration if I apply this technique. It's the same if you go for the Russian needle technique. If you do too much harm to this intersection between mucosa and then that's mm -hmm. called squamous epidermal cells, you will have a certain migration of the filler. And it often migrates in a cranial direction and also in a caudal direction in the lower lip as the concentric movement of our orbicularis is spreading the filler in a cranial and caudal direction. So be, be aware of this with the cannula. Um, I don't know about you guys. If, if I want to frame this, um, I use a needle. 32 gauge, tilt it a little bit, and um, works perfectly fine for me. Yeah, I do. I do the same. Sorry, Nazareth. Uh, I, I do the same. I use only a needle for the the border or the, of the lips for the vermilion border, and never the cannula. Also, because in the, um, I think that if we are we we can be more precise on the in the dermis creating a very good projection very good definition of the vermilion border stain in the uh, dermis using the needle you you can enter you cannot enter the the, the dermis with a cannula so um, i think that it's better to use the to use the needle if you want to volum volumize the um, the, 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 the lips uh, maybe you can use also the uh, the cannula as you said uh, before perfect all right then i think we're gonna wrap it up right here it's uh, almost two hours already um we we had a lot of participants um so i think we don't want to want to overdo it um from my side thank you so much natsura thank you so much andrea for sharing your clinical pearls um this was definitely a refreshing really interesting innovative take of how you use this comprehensive portfolio of bioscience um i'm really much looking forward to to see both of you in person discuss more um also to our participants a big thank you obviously if there are any questions left you can um write write us on the instagram you can write the bioscience account um, at least on my behalf, you can also write me on Instagram. I'm going to try to get back to you. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Natsura. Thank you so much, Andrea. And I'm um, looking forward to continue this discussion soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And see you soon. If you have any question, please write it and all of us will answer it. I do this. I say the same. If you have any question, you can write also using our social uh, channels and uh, thank you very much for your attention bye we did it are we still online i think we did it yeah. <laughs> we did it